watching Daybreak Asia coming to you live from New York, Sydney and Hong Kong. We're counting down to the market opens in Tokyo and Seoul. Australia has just come online. The top stories this hour. Asian stocks are set for a weaker open as signs of US economic resilience further unwinding bets on imminent Fed rate cuts. That cautious message being reinforced in Davos too. We hear this hour from the MasterCard CEO and the IMF's Deputy Managing Director. Plus, Apple auditors again stop selling its latest smartwatches over a patent fight, while Samsung teases its own expanded health tech push. Well, Heidi, Sherry, we've got the open of the ASX 200 here. At the start of the day, it's really just, you can already see, uh, tracking the moves we had in the Wall Street session. So uh, not to get into too many details of it, but uh, at a headline, we had the U.S. retail sales, a strong reading coming through, telling us that the consumer is resilient. And perhaps the Fed really won't have any need to start cutting rates as soon as March of this year. So traders are continuing to push back their bets, and that's driving up yields higher. We saw Treasuries moving, and you can see that again in the Aussie three-year, the 10-year at the start of the day. It's also a story of, of US dollar strength, and we have seen that across the course of this week. So the Aussie dollar trending back around that 65-cent level. These are negative factors for equities, and again, you can see that expressed because we have the ASX 200, uh, three-tenths of a cent to the downside, but this is a fifth straight day of losses so far that we're seeing. Let's change on because that's sort of the dynamic that we're expecting across equities in Asia today. Kiwi ones already online. Uh, Nikkei futures, that's the Chicago contract, but again pointing to a drop, even though we have seen that dollar strength, that move in treasuries leading to Japanese currency weakness because the yen there trading at 148. Uh, China, really the other part that is causing investors a lot of, of concern in the Asian region because we had more signals of economic weakness coming through in the Chinese economy. That really spooked investors in the Hong Kong session yesterday, also for mainland equity. So it's that selling pressure that we're really not seeing stemming just yet, even though, Sherry, there are actual, actually signals of the national team in China stepping in to buy once again. Annabelle, we do have uh, just a little crossing the Bloomberg. Uh, when it comes to Cheryl Sandberg, I suppose sort of incrementally uh, steps away from Meta, right, as we've, as we've seen her transition away from this company that she's really become quite synonymous, synonymous with. Cheryl Sandberg now to exit Meta's board, according to reporting from Axios. She will become an informal advisor to Meta in May, according to this same report. So the former Meta chief operating officer, Cheryl Sandberg, planning to leave Meta's board of directors, according to Axios, to become the informal advisor to the company May. Of course, you know, this has been sort of a, 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 a long time coming in terms of the story, right? She joined the firm back when it was just that small startup called Facebook. Right, Heidi, take a look at how U.S. futures are coming online early in the Asian session. We're seeing a little bit of down south, but very muted at the moment after stocks and bonds fell in the New York session. We had the fear gauge VIX uh, jumping to the highest level since November, briefly topping its 200-day moving average. We, of course, were watching some idiosyncratic news around Apple as well, down for a second session, given that the challenges continue in that uh, dispute over patents with Massimo. At the same time, of course, we're following oil prices. We're seeing slight upside in the Asian session as well, carrying on from the Wall Street session. But it's been really that push and pull when it comes to tensions in the Middle East uh, versus, of course, the crude production halts that we've seen here in the U.S. given the cold front that we're facing. But it's really to do with expectations of where the Fed goes from here, right? Because those aggressive bets on the easing have been pared back a little bit. So we had the Treasury sell-off continue here in the U.S. We had the 10-year yield topping 4.1%, the two-year yield topping 4.3%, and really reacting to that resilient economic data that we've been seeing here, especially when it comes to retail sales topping expectations, not to mention that the Fed Beige Book was also talking about really strong consumer spending, Heidi. Let's get some more, Sherry, when it comes to the latest eco data, how it feeds into Fed expectations. Our U.S. economy reporter Steve Matthews is along with us. And Steve, what sort of jumped out to you in terms of the implications of the retail sales numbers? Yeah, the retail sales numbers were the strongest in three months, you know, and it's for December, which is an important month, obviously, with the holiday season. And it required Wall Street and uh, government forecasters 
to raise their forecast for gross domestic product, which will be reported next uh, for, for the uh, fourth quarter, which will be reported next week. And this, so the Atlanta Fed, for example, raised its estimate of GDP for the fourth quarter to 2.4% from 2.2%. And that is above trend growth. And it is much stronger than anyone was expecting. You know, Wall Street economists all last year were expecting the recession from start really starting in the first quarter. And we've gone through each quarter. And then the, the final quarter, yet again, the story is that the growth is going to be stronger. And that's the reason that the Fed is not in a hurry to, uh, to cut rates, because if the growth is going strong, then, you know, there's really no rush to, to do anything to try to create more growth. Yeah, we've seen the narrative of strong consumer spending really being reflected on the Fed beige book as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, the, the Beige Book is a report of the 12 uh, Fed banks in which they report a lot of anecdotes uh, th from business contacts and nonprofit contacts. And, you know, it was just kind of laced through with details of uh, businesses that were seeing stronger growth. Uh, you, you know, in New York in particular, uh, it was doing really well with, uh, with hotels were packed, uh, retail sales were doing much better than expected. You know, you, you just saw this kind of detail throughout where uh, th there's an increased optimism about 2024 really throughout the 12 districts. U.S. economy reporter Steve Matthews there. Our next guest says investors have largely hung the mission accomplished banner on the Fed's chances of achieving a soft economic landing. With us now is Burns McKinney, senior portfolio manager at NFJ Investment Group. Burns, great to have you with us. I mean, we saw bond yields falling towards that 4% level when it comes to a 10-year yield. We're paring back some of those aggressive easing expectations at this point, but where are we headed for the rest of the year? Well, one thing that we definitely expect to see this year is a continuation of the trend that we had in 2023, whereby um, just what's going on with the 10-year Treasury yield and interest rates is probably the single biggest determinant of, of, of equity prices. Um, you know, you saw, for example, when the Fed announced their pivot in December, um, you saw a rally in everything. You know, we like to say that you know, investors got a great 2024 during the fourth quarter of 2023. And you know, with respect to what we can expect this year, um, you know, there, there's certainly some promising factors. Uh, inflation continues to drop. It's not dropping in a straight line. But, you know, when you look at the latest inflation figures, not only is, you know, over the last three months, if you take the three-month core inflation and annualize that, you're looking at, you know, 2.4%, pretty close to the Fed's target. And, in fact, some of that data is stale with respect to shelter. If you actually plug in real-time shelter costs, it appears that inflation is already at or near the Fed's you know, two percent target, and so as inflation pulls back, um, it does give the Fed a lot of leeway to uh, reduce interest rates. Not necessarily due to economic softness, but just because you know, if inflation's lower, your your inflation adjust your real interest rates are already kind of restricted, and so they may cut those this year. That said, a lot of that news has been priced in. Um, investors really have sort of, again, just hung the banner on a soft economic landing. And, you know, when you consider that, that the news should be good for stocks, but, you know, with the S&P trading at you know, 22 times forward earnings, um, that's more expensive than it's been about 75 percent of the time. And so uh, returns might be a little bit muted just simply based on uh, what our starting point is for stocks. Yeah, especially given that we're seeing that slight pullback at the moment. But then does that mean that you can find better valuations in other markets? What do you like? Well, there's two ways to approach this, one of which, when I say better markets, you might just think of better markets within the United States. Uh, a lot of what drove the market last year was that that magnificent seven of you know the big tech stocks. And you know, as a result of that, one of the things we've seen since the Fed made that pivot has been a broadening uh, of returns so that a lot of what didn't do as well last year is starting to perform better. You know, some of the things that have been left behind, things like utilities, like healthcare, 
even like some of the financials and regional banks, sort of the, the, the rather than the Magnificent Seven, you've got the Monday 493. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of names in that section of the market that have gone basically nowhere for two years, even while earnings have grown. And so you have um, better entry points, better valuations for just good old fashioned stock pickers. So you have opportunities there. And uh, as well, I think it's instructive to note that um, you know, whereas the U.S. market is trading above its long-term averages, um, overseas markets are still offering pretty good discounts. Given that we also have a stronger U.S. dollar to contend with, what international markets could benefit in this environment? Because usually when we talk about international markets, a strong dollar doesn't help, especially those smaller, more vulnerable emerging economies. Well, with the Fed being one of the first central banks around the world to pivot to softening interest rates, that could lead to an easing of the dollar. And usually if the dollar starts easing off, that ends up being great for emerging markets investors for a couple of reasons, one of which is simply you have a lot of countries that have debt denominated in dollars that takes the financial burden off of them, as well as just if you invest overseas, the returns that you garner back here in the United States um, in dollar terms uh, end up doing better if the dollar weakens just a little bit. And so you have that, um, you know, Japan's been on a tear, but that said, valuations have gotten a little bit richer there. Um, but I mentioned emerging markets equities are at attractive entry point valuations. And yeah, likewise, you know, China, it's its not for the faint of heart. Uh, but you know, if you look, you know, for example, I know the S&P right now, if you look at its 10 year average, it's trading at about a 20 percent premium to its 10 year average, whereas um, MSCI China is now trading at over a 30 percent discount to its 10 year average. Um, you know, it's you know, there's certainly been a lot of concerns there when they um, sort of unlocked the economy from some of the COVID lockdowns. That's been a little bit bumpy, but mm. you know, the way we like to think about it, you, you, if, you, if you've had your leg in a cast, you take that cast off, you've got to walk before you run. And a lot of the, the headwinds in China, such as you know, those lockdowns, such as the regulatory crackdowns on the tech giants, uh, some of those headwinds are actually turning to tailwinds this year. And so, again, investors do need to be selective, but there might be opportunities simply just based on entry point valuations that are at 20 year lows there. I mean, China has continued to disappoint despite the fact that it's pretty cheap relative to other markets, especially given that investor confidence seems to be lacking. Also, not just that, but uh, the consumer confidence among their own citizens seems to be lacking and that really domestic demand is not being propelled at the moment. So in which sector? Sectors, would you be able to hedge given the uncertainty that that market still faces? Yeah, I think that you know some of the places that you know investors should look. I you know you, you need to be wary of the of the property uh, markets. I think there sh there could be some overvaluations there. Um, you know, investors have to be especially selective if they look into the banks over there. But you know, I think if you have to probably, if anything, take advantage of this low near term entry point to take advantage of some longer term secular trends, where whether that's the the growing of the middle class in China would be one way to look. Um, you know, likewise, healthcare is is a good place to go there um, as well. Prince McKinney, good to have you with us, senior portfolio manager at NFJ Investment Group. And it's still early in the Asian session, but let's turn to Bell for some of those movers. Bell. Thanks, Sherry. Yeah, just one move that we're tracking this morning. That's Qantas Airways. That's the, the, the national carrier in Australia. A big management change that came through this morning. So Andrew Glantz, he's been named as the new CEO of the Loyalty Business Unit. Uh, loyalty Business is actually Australia's biggest loyalty program, so a significant leadership change there. But Andrew Glantz replacing Olivia Worth. She announced her resignation in October of last year. At Qantas, we know an airline that is still really grappling to win back the confidence of consumers in Australia, Heidi. Yeah, after uh, what was a challenging year, if we can put it that way. Coming up next, Samsung eyeing double-digit growth for its latest flagship smartphone series, powered with a range of new AI features. We get the details next. This is Bloomberg.
Apple has to stop selling its smartwatches with a blood oxygen feature in the US. It marks yet another legal setback in the iPhone maker's patent dispute with Massimo. Bloomberg's technology reporter Mark Gurman joins us now. Mark, you've been following sort of each incremental uh, legal development. How does this rank in terms of you know best to worst case scenario and, and what happens from here? Uh, this is a bombshell, and I would put it in the worst-case scenario category. Uh, this means that Apple's two-week stay on its Apple Watch Ultra 2 and Apple Watch Series 9 uh, being able to be sold uh, is over. Uh, at this point, Apple either has to stop sales of the Apple Watch tomorrow morning, 2 a.m. Pacific time, or instead they have to remove the blood oxygen feature from the device. And so this does not put Apple in a great position. Obviously, the Apple Watch is extraordinarily key uh, to the company's bottom line and its future. But at the same time, I think if Apple makes the decision, which I believe they have, to simply remove blood oxygen and continue selling the device, I think they'll be in good shape. I don't think there's many people who are buying the Apple Watch specifically for the O2 feature. So I don't think it's a huge deal. It's more of a uh, small victory for Massimo. But obviously, anytime you get Apple to remove a feature, it's a, it's a pretty big development. And the company is facing challenges on multiple fronts. We're now hearing that it could potentially face a DOJ antitrust case as soon as March. Yeah, my colleagues in Washington, D.C. are reporting that the DOJ is taking an increasingly strong look at the company and some of their practices related to uh, how they prefer their own software over competing software, how they tie in with their hardware to a stronger degree than third-party hardware. Uh, so certainly that's something the DOJ is taking a look at. I, I believe that the Justice Department is going to wait until March to do anything because they're going to have to see first how Apple makes changes to its practices in response to the European Union's Digital Markets Act. So once we see how those uh, initiatives are, are resolved, then we'll have a better idea if the DOJ is probably going to move forward or not. Mark, last year was such a challenging year volume-wise for sellers of handsets, right? What are we seeing from Samsung in terms of trying to get more of that competitive edge? So Samsung is all in on artificial intelligence. This morning they released their Samsung S24 line. Instead of focusing on major hardware changes or major camera changes, they're all in on Google Gemini models to integrate features like circle uh, an image or a video to get more information, to summarize something in your notepad, to take an audio recording and summarize that. One really cool feature is live translations. Uh, you can be on a phone call with someone around the world, you can be talking to them in your language, and they'll hear you in their language and vice versa. So some deeply integrated AI features. Bloomberg Tech reporter Mark Gurman there with the latest on Samsung and Apple as well. Well, let's turn to Japanese tech giant NEC. It's seeing growing demand for its Japanese language generative AI, which was launched last year. And its CEO, Takayuki Morita, says they're seeing applications booming in 2024. Last year, uh, we launched Japanese language-based, our own generative AI. A first in the world, and uh, very compact, and uh, very well uh, fine-tuned to the very suitable situations. And uh, also, the, uh, it's very secure, either in uh, like a cloud, or maybe you can run on the like a chip, uh, very on-premise environment. So what are the future investment plans since there's great demand for it and what are your targets? Yeah, actually um, this is coming from the, our decision which was made three years ago. At the time, uh, our researchers uh, pushed me to invest into buying the HPC uh, for their own researches. And at that time, I didn't imagine uh, how this is leading to our innovations. But uh, at that time, we invested about 100 million and to provide the uh, R&D environment to our researchers. Uh, they came up to the ideas and creating very compact sized and versatile and very easy fine tuned to the individual environment. And uh, so that that is a kind of uh, uh, like investment we made first. And then uh, next year and this year, uh, we continuously invest into this field. 
into the uh, foundation model and also the applications. I believe that application is uh, booming this year. That was NAC CEO and President Takayuki Morita speaking with Bloomberg's husband Armin there at Davos. You can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers can find that at Daybreak Go. It's also available on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customize those settings so you just get the news on the industries and assets that matter to you. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. The CEO of Standard Charter says the market is getting a little bit ahead of itself on interest rate cuts this year. We spoke to Bill Winters at the World Economic Forum in Davos, where he told us the global economy is holding up well despite wars in the Middle East and Ukraine. I must say, 2024 is starting off from a banking perspective quite well. I mean, we know all the problems in the world, and we are always concerned how those are going to affect the, the operating results of, of our bank or, or others or, or our customers. So far, so good. <clears throat> I think the, the economy is in a, in a reasonably good place. Of course, the, the, the tensions that are carrying over from last year are still there. Uh, obviously, the war in the Middle East is, is a big preoccupation, and uh, concerns that that will spread, uh, although it seems manageable so far from, a, from an, an economic perspective, yes. obviously, uh, perhaps not from a humanitarian perspective, and um, likewise uh, conflict in, in Europe, and uh, likewise the, the geopolitical tension. So, but these are, I won't say we're used to these things, but they've been around for a while. Uh, it, would, it would appear that no one has an interest in, in taking you know, very substantial specific conflicts and turning them into major global operations. Uh, you know, and I, I hope I'm not wrong on that. You know, the market is definitely pricing in a lot of cuts. Yeah. Um, from the Fed, I don't know what that means for your trading floor. Are they ready? Like, this is, we could see a lot of volatility. We could. Uh, although the markets have been quite well behaved. I, I think the Fed has done a good job of, of forecasting and, 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 and indicating yeah. for guidance uh, their intentions. I think the market might be a little bit ahead of itself in terms of, of rate cuts this year. Uh, I, I, I have no doubt that we'll get to rate cuts at some point. I suspect it'll be a little bit later in the year. So we have this debate within Standard Chartered all the time. And uh, you know, we're, we're, we're positioned in terms of our, our from a treasury perspective, we're, we're partially hedged, but you know, we're, we're OK. Standard Chartered CEO Bill Winters there, speaking with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix there at Davos. The latest on the corporate front and some of the stories are watching shares in Charles Schwab had some losses on the company reported, uh, after the company reported, I should say, fourth quarter profit that was down by almost half. Net new assets were also down 48%. Bank deposits declined 21%. CEO Walt Bedinger says 2023 was his worst time with the company since the internet bubble burst in the year 2000. Japanese mega bank Mizuho is planning to ramp up its expansion into private markets. A top executive says the company's $460 billion money management arm is considering buying a stake in a US or European firm specializing in alternative investments. Mizuho is targeting a five-fold increase in alternative assets under management that's equivalent to around $135 billion. Well, coming up next on Daybreak, our conversation with the IMF First Deputy Managing Director, Gita Gopanath. Take a listen to why she thinks market bets on quick rate cuts may be premature. This is Bloomberg. We have breaking news. Goodyear is now planning to name Stellantis executive Mark Stewart as chief executive officer following a pressure campaign from activist investor Elliott Investment Management. This is according to people speaking to Bloomberg. Now, Goodyear is expected to announce Stewart's appointment as CEO as soon as this week. A representative for the company didn't immediately respond to a request for comment, but we know that the manufacturer initiated a review to maximize shareholder value last July after shedding jobs to deal with softening demand and spiraling inflation. And we're now hearing from people familiar with the matter that Goodyear will is planning to name Stellantis executive Mark Stewart as CEO as soon as this week.
Right. We continue to watch those market expectations about Fed rate cuts. Well, that may be a little bit uh, premature. Uh, that's according to the IMF's first deputy managing director, Gita Gopinath. Speaking with Bloomberg, she said the battle against inflation isn't over yet. Going into also 2024, the U.S., of course, did very strongly. The euro area, you know, less well. But we've had upgrades for several of these countries, including China in the second half. Now, uh, that said, I think we certainly should be jumping the gun and think that everything is done. When it comes to inflation, the job is not done. I think markets are being a little exuberant, expecting as many rate cuts as they've put in. I think it's important to be cautious take the time, look at all the data that's coming in, and then move slowly. And that's consistent with what you're hearing from central bankers uh, now. And so, do you, I mean, again, do you worry about a policy mistake if they cut too much and too quickly? Or do you just see if you, if you, you know, study uh, the inflation numbers, we, we just can't cry victory yet? It's a combination of both, because I do believe that with inflation, and if you look at services inflation, it is coming down, but it is still, you know, not going down very fast. So I think we still have some stickiness in services inflation. Mm -hmm. Wage growth is still quite healthy in many countries. Now, on the other hand, of course, monetary transmission still has to work through the system. So there are still mm -hmm. some downside risks. The problem is that if you cut rates, and that totally solidifies expectations of the direction of travel. And that is hard to unwind. And therefore, given where we are, given the relative resilience of the economy and of labor markets, it's important to take the time. I mean, what's the biggest unknown? So apart from conflicts and geopolitics, and we'll maybe get onto that in a second, is it really how, how China, the economy, will perform? China's economy, uh, you know, the latest number that came out for the year as a whole exceeds the 5% target that they had set, so at 5.2%. I mean, that's, I guess, the good news. But on the other hand, there are some deeper issues uh, in China. Of course, you have the aging demographics. You have a property sector that is still in a very tough spot. Local government finances are also in a tough spot. So if you look at our projection, for instance, for China going out, say, four to five years, we have growth at about 3.5%. So these headwinds play an important role in our projections. Now, that said, the Chinese government has stimulus ability. It can do the reforms to change the course. But there are important headwinds. IMF First Deputy Managing Director Gita Gopinath there with our colleague Francine Lacroix at Davos. Uh, and of course, sticking with China's economic weakness and the chart that, the, that market reaction Annabelle is taking a look at, uh, what are some pretty horrible numbers for Hong Kong? Yeah, well, it's Hong Kong in particular because yesterday it was that continued selling pressure for mainland equities and also on the Hang Seng, but really it, it was Hong Kong that, that bore the brunt of it down nearly 4% into the close. Putting it in context more so, it was the worst day that we've seen for, for equities in the city in more than a year, about 15 months, 100% of the index members closed in the red. So it was really just, of course, you can see that very, very broad base, that, that pressure that was coming through, and a lot of anxiety in the market as well because trading volume 70, 80% above their averages and at least $100 billion in value erased as well. Now, when you talk about value being erased, let's bring up this chart here and take a look at, at just how much has been pulled out of Hong Kong and mainland equities because nearly six trillion dollars has now been taken off uh, it's really these concerns that we've continued to see around China's economic weakness that's of course really playing into it there's geopolitical tensions there's also just rate differentials as well because investors are preferring uh, to, to, to stay in money markets instead of putting their money into to stocks in the city uh, given Hong Kong very much caught in following the Fed with the HKMA but then also really expressing as well those concerns around what's going going on in mainland China's economy. Let's change on. When you take a look at just how much has been erased, that also puts perhaps that, that uh, question of whether the market cap that we've seen, how much is erased, whether that will actually change where are the biggest markets in the region. And India could soon overtake Hong Kong, so that would make it the fourth largest stock market in the world. It really has been that big run-up we've seen in Indian, Japanese equities. And uh, Heidi, of course, it's not just China that's feeling the brunt because we've also seen a lot of selling pressure so far in Korea this year. 
Yeah, it has just been a, a turbulent start to the year for a number of these markets, right, with a lot of uncertainties. And as Bell mentioned, a lot of these uncertainties when it comes to the Chinese consumer, the market there is affecting uh, tech and, and Apple and Samsung in particular. It has been a very, very challenging year for handset sellers in 2023. And Samsung is eyeing double digit growth, though, when it comes to its latest flagship smartphone series. They're really betting on the Galaxy S24 product family. It is being powered by a range of AI features, including a live voice and text translation of calls. Last year, Samsung lost its top spot in global smartphone shipments to Apple. For more, Kieran G. Kaur, who's the RDC Asia Pacific Associates Research Director for Mobile Phones Research, joins us now. Kieran G., great to have you with us. And, you know, I get your reaction when it comes to uh, the big Samsung unveiling. Do you think this AI phone is going to be enough to snatch back some of that market share, which, you know, as a broader market, it looks to be quite challenging this year again. <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, uh, I feel that these uh, ton of AI announcements or AI features that Samsung has introduced on its phone, uh, it, it brings a refreshing change to the market. Uh, for a lot of people who were saying that, you know, they're bored of, you know, like same incremental or small incremental changes in the uh, hardware uh, year on year, uh, it's probably something new for them to try on. It's probably something for them uh, to entice them to come and try these new devices and uh, possibly upgrade to these new devices. You've said, though, you expect more of the recovery in the lower price components, so that tells me perhaps the Chinese manufacturers and the brands as well, right? What's the outlook when it comes to this rivalry between Apple and Samsung this year? Uh, I think it's just going to get even more intense. Uh, both of them are vying for the premium segment of the market. And in the last few years, we've seen uh, the premium segment has outperformed the low end segment. Uh, and both Apple and Samsung have been vying to uh, get their share of the pie in, in this space. And with, uh, you know, like we've seen in 2023, Apple's done tremendously well uh, coming to the top of the market with their iPhone 15 range and iPhone 15 Pro Max doing uh, really well in the market. And now with Samsung introducing their uh, new Galaxy range with these AI features, I think um, it, it's, the competition is going to get more intense. And now we'll see a host of announcements from all other major uh, uh, vendors talking about AI features in their phones. And at the same time for Samsung, I think it's going to be tough as these Chinese players start to double down on their efforts to um, also expand their share in the low end segment where they had kind of lost some share in the last couple of years. So it sounds like you think, uh, you know, AI components or AI uh, features is going to be kind of the new thing across the board for the different brands. What are some of the challenges, though, that come with, you know, uh, unleashing this sort of AI technology on your handphone? I think so far we've just seen like a uh, small set of features uh, and you know AI on smartphones has been there for a long time. Uh, we've seen uh, some of the tools being integrated into photography, into uh, natural language processing, but now we'll see more of it in, uh, you know, uh, across the board on, on the smartphone. And with that, I think we'll also have to find solutions to issues like security, to privacy um, uh, and authentic authenticity of the photos and all the other content that's being generated through these AI tools. And this is something with these players will have to figure out as we go along on this journey. Apple's facing some challenges of its own, right? The latest setback in its patent dispute with Massimo. How big a deal is this? I mean, we spoke with our, our correspondent about it earlier, and he said, look, ultimately, there's probably not a lot of people that are buying uh, Apple Watches just for the blood oxygen feature. But does this is this just incrementally another issue for Apple to contend with? Uh, definitely so, uh, but at the same time, watch is not the biggest revenue generator for Apple. I think the bigger challenge for them is how they can answer some of these, um, you know, like as other competitors are talking more about AI in their smartphones. And it's not that Apple is not integrating AI or machine learning into their features, uh, but it's more about how they can uh, make a little bit more noise about what their, uh, the iPhones can do with these features compared to some of these Android players. How are you assessing the Chinese market at the moment? Because clearly weakness uh, for the China consumer, not to mention some of the 
you know, PR, regulatory, sort of government ban headlines that we've seen affect Apple, is that going to play out in a meaningful way? Uh, yes, so we've seen this upheaval in the China market uh, back from, you know, 2019-2020 when the ban on Huawei smartphones came in or, you know, like how it could, its uh, ability to import some of the components was impaired and then we saw a shift in terms of uh, premium customers moving from Huawei to Apple and now with Huawei coming back into the mix, we see a lot of consumers going back from Apple to Huawei or even from other Android uh, premium players to Huawei. So we'll see this shift continue to happen in 2024 uh, but at the same time I think it's uh, also challenging because the consumer buying power has uh, also suffered in China in the last uh, couple of quarters a couple of years so it's, it's going to be very difficult for these players to kind of uh, uh, gain shares especially when it comes to the high-end segment of the market what about the product lineup for Apple going into this year? Are any of the sort of uh, upgrades or semi upgrades going to be kind of making a meaningful difference to appetite? Uh, so, yeah, I think we'll have to see what Apple announces for their iPhone 16 lineup. There are rumors that, you know, Apple's going to integrate a lot more uh, AI and machine learning features into whether it's their photography, videography, or even uh, productivity-related uh, features. But, yeah, I think we'll have to see what finally gets announced. Uh, but I think uh, what we need to look in the midterm is how uh, Apple performs in the first half of this year. Uh, and interestingly, uh, you know, in, in the past we didn't see the kind of discounts that for iPhone lineup that uh, you know we've been seeing in the past uh, one or two years uh, and that's probably Apple's reaction to the market demand which has been slowing down and these price discounts are helping the or you know to stir demand in the consumer segment. Karen Jukawa, IDC Asia Pacific Associate Research Director for Mobile Phones Research. Much more to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. You're watching the Rick Asia. Yemen's Houthi rebels say they've attacked an American vessel in the Gulf of Aden with anti-ship ballistic missiles. U.S. Central Command confirmed the ship was the U.S.-owned Genko Picardy, saying there were no injuries and the vessel remained seaworthy. The latest attack came after the U.S. again designated the Houthis a terrorist group that partly unwinds a move President Biden made early in his administration as the U.S. sought to ease a humanitarian crisis in Yemen. We continue to see WTI supported in the Asian session. Of course, those Middle East tensions have led to some gains in the price of oil. OPEC is now out with its first detailed outlook for 2025, and it expects global oil demand to rise next year and exceed growth in supplies. Bloomberg Su Keenan joins us now with the latest, and Sue, a lot of that demand could come from China. Yeah, China is the world's largest consumer. Its economy expected to rebound, according to OPEC, as is the global economy economy, driving a robust surge in demand by 2025 in their monthly report that they just released. They see a gain of 1.8 million barrels a day next year. They see rival supplies, that's a reference to production from U.S. and non-OPEC members, as expanding by 1.3 million barrels a day. And whether this bullish output will be borne out or not remains unclear, but it means that oil markets are set to remain in deficit through the end of next year. That is, unless Saudi Arabia and its allies, which have launched new production curbs this month, decide to boost output significantly, and at least one analyst, Vital, the world's largest independent oil trader, is predicting that will happen, that Saudi Arabia may end their voluntary crude production cuts later this year. That would put downward pressure on prices. Uh, meanwhile, OPEC issued the forecast um, a little earlier than normal 
Journal, and on this same day, its top official published a rebuttal to predictions that oil demand is heading toward a peak. This was an effort by the OPEC Secretary General to push back against expectations that climate change is going to cap the use of fossil fuels. As for this year, 2024, OPEC expects global oil demand to increase by two and a quarter million barrels a day to a record 104.36 million a day. That's unchanged from previous forecasts. The full OPEC Plus, the 22 nation coalition, due to hold an online monitoring meeting, monitoring meeting on the first week of February, in fact, on February 1st. Well, meanwhile, New York traded oil futures extending gains in Asia trading. It has been such a choppy session, though. Yeah, there's a lot of volatility. And as we just saw, the latest developments with the Houthi rebels are a big part of that volatility. Concern about geopolitical risk. Concern that the Israel-Hamas uh, Israel, uh, war uh, could expand beyond Gaza. And so there is that. Meanwhile, you had the stronger dollar, which is typically bearish uh, for oil. And so there were wild $2 swings in NYMEX in the New York session, ending with a gain that we're now seeing uh, a bit higher and extending in Asia. Uh, Brent crude, in the meanwhile, was lower at the end of the latest session in London. It's important to point out that WTI's prop spread, which is a critical gauge for supply and demand, actually settled in a bullish structure known as backwardization. We haven't seen that since November. Um, but to sum it all up, uh, there are a a lot of issues, and here in the U.S., which is weighing on West Texas Intermediate, we have a major uh, stream of frigid weather. Uh, New York got by uh, with just a dusting of snow, but very cold temperatures. Out in the West, in Texas and North Dakota, we've seen an interruption uh, in the state's refineries and oil processing. In fact, more than half of North Dakota's oil production is now offline. That's as much as 700,000 barrels a day not being produced. So one top uh, energy Energy trader at CIBC Private Wealth, summing it up by saying the latest geopolitical incidents could incite short-term uh, short covering, but long-term, this is only providing a buffer for the otherwise weak fundamental environment. There is a growing view that general direction, bigger picture, is lower for oil prices. Bloomberg Sue Keenan there with the latest on oil. Well, coming up next, we'll take a look ahead to the market open in Tokyo. The outlook when it comes to Japanese equities, there are still these signs that the rally is losing steam after what has been uh, a really strong start to the year. This is Bloomberg. Big miss for Japan core machine orders for the month of November, a month on month, a contraction of 4.9%. The expectation was of a contraction of less than 1%, and we're in positive territory in the previous month of October. Now, when it comes to the year on year number, we're also seeing a 5% contraction, much larger than the contraction that we saw in the previous month of around 2%, not to mention that the expectation was for actual growth of around 0.1%. So, both the month on month and the year-on-year -year number for core machine orders in Japan, uh, missing to the downside. Of course, we know that uh, this is a leading indicator of Japanese business spending, so this perhaps not boding well uh, for CapEx going forward. Again, the month-on-month -month number, a contraction of 4.9% for the month of November. Let's look ahead to the Tokyo Open and signs that the market may be overbought after its recent rally. Our senior Asia stock reporter Hideyuki Sano joins us now. Hide, I want to ask if this rally has finally run out of steam, but at the same time, we talked to so many investors and analysts, and they seem to be pretty upbeat about the Japanese market. Hi there. Yeah, exactly. Um, in the very short term, the market seems to be running out of steam. Uh, after after a very strong rally last week. Now, we just had a report from the Ministry of Finance that foreign uh, investors bought more than one trillion yen of Japanese stocks last week, and that's uh, probably one of the biggest in record. Not, not probably not the, the, you know, the biggest, but one of the biggest. Uh, and uh, that was the main driver of the market. Now, um, 
when things like this happen, um, then this tends to last longer. I mean, it's unlikely to be one of buying. So that is why many analysts are still optimistic about uh, the outlook of the Japanese market. And also, uh, a lot of analysts are also talking about uh, Japanese retail investors, which got a new tax-free investment account. Um, called, it's called NISA. And uh, while we still don't have exact data on uh, how, how much they have bought, uh, anecdotal evidence is do suggest that their risk appetite is very strong. So in the very short term, uh, yes, the market seems to be running out of steam, but um, many analysts still seem to be very optimistic about the outlook. Some analysts, in fact, bullish to the point of potentially seeing the Nikkei hitting the record 39,000 in the second part of the year. In terms of what's driving the optimism, is it still the carryover over the same, you know, this time it's different themes that we saw drive the rally last year? Uh, yes, basically the, the, the theme is the same as last year. I guess it, it's a question about what kind of evidences we can get uh, this year. I mean, people have been expecting that inflation is going to take hold in Japan. Um, and the key question here is whether we're going to get uh, wage increases. And basically, people are still optimistic because many companies have promised a big uh, pay uh, rises. Um, but we still have to wait for a few months to see if that's really happening. Our senior Asia stock reporter Hideyuki Sano there with latest on uh, what Japanese stocks are doing. And these are some of the specific names we'll be watching when trade begins in Korea and Japan in just a few minutes' time. Samsung, obviously, in focus, is targeting double digit growth for its latest flagship smartphone series, of course, which all hinges around AI technology in its latest phones. We're also watching Mizuho Financial, which is planning to dramatically ramp up the expansion into private markets to tap growing demand from Japanese institutional investors. We'll also be watching Watching some of these uh, Japan airlines as well, the number of foreign visitors to the country in 2023 recovering to some 80% of pre-pandemic levels. Worth noting though that Japan Airlines is also appointing Mitsuko Totori as a former flight attendant as the first female president. Market opens are next. This is Bloomberg. This is Zebra Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. After another day of losses for U.S. stocks and bonds, we had more positive retail sales data, not to mention the Fed beige book leading to traders to pair back those aggressive bets on Fed easing. Yeah, Sherry, this is really uh, good news. It's bad news when it comes to market expectations for Fed easing. And more broadly, global central banks are really kind of scratching their heads in terms of what the next steps will be and how quickly we'll get there is really the topic of debate, whether you're talking about Fed speakers or conversations taking place at Davos. And as you mentioned, it's not just stocks that are suffering, but we're seeing really global bonds poised for the worst week since May last year. Let's get you to Bell to take a look at uh, if we're going to see any kind of joy at the open bell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Futures were a guide here, but we've got the open for Japan and Korea. And as you said, it really is the, that uh, assessment of the, of the latest U.S. economic data. Certainly, if we get any good news on the economic data front, and we had that in the retail sales, that signal of resilience, it is bad news for asset classes. And so we saw U.S. stocks, bonds dropping in the prior se session after that reading. So the 10-year yield, that's the restart of cash markets there for Treasuries. And you're still holding above the 4% mark. Uh, that leads to dollar strength. It leads to Japanese currency weakness that had been actually uh, sort of a positive for Japanese equities, but perhaps a little bit due for a pullback to a degree, given we had seen such a run-up not only over the course of last year, but also the start of 2024. 
There's also uh, the signals that we're still getting in Japan's economy as well. Uh, core machine orders, that data just down in the last 10 minutes or so, and a big drop on what we had been expecting from economists. So down 4.9% on the month, uh, a lot more than what had been expected, again, by economists, as I said. So a reason, perhaps, that the BOJ does need to keep with its dovish policy settings, but not really seeing much of a market reaction in the Japanese yen at this point. But uh, equities, as I said, two tenths of a percent to the downside for the Nikkei 225. Let's uh, switch on and take a look at what we're seeing in the Korean trading session so far because we have seen emerging market assets under pressure. The Korean won really bearing the brunt of that dollar strength in the prior session. Today, fairly steady, but we did actually hear from FX authorities, uh, unnamed, but saying that the one weakness that we have seen this year is somewhat excessive. Otherwise, in the session today, we're also keeping an eye on what's happening with Samsung because we did actually see it unveiling a new flagship phone and we are seeing Samsung rising there just a little bit to, to start the day. To Australia now, we're one hour into the session for the ASX 200. We are looking ahead to economic data uh, in this hour, so 30 minutes from now we'll get the latest jobs numbers and we are expecting to see a slowdown. Important, of course, because the RBA meeting is just a few weeks away. Uh, we are really just tracking whether we can expect to see any sort of talk of cuts on the horizon, but the RBA really one of the central banks that is set to stay higher for longer, given it was late to enter the rate hiking cycle. The Aussie dollar, as I said, unchanged at this point and we're seeing WTI just a little bit high, but it's really that choppy session because investors are, are looking at what we're getting in terms of supply. There's lower supply coming in from the US. You've got Red Sea tensions as well. But then on the flip side to that, it's just these continued concerns that we have around the health of the global economy and Chinese demand really part of that as well, Heidi. Well, I want to bring our next guest who says it is a new era for Asia and emerging market equities led by Japan and India, of course, two of the most darling plays of 2023. Let's bring in Jonathan Garner, who's a chief Asia and EM strategist at Morgan Stanley. Jonathan, really wonderful to have you with us. And let me start off with Japan, with the kind of uh, precariousness of how Japanese equities sit at the moment after a particularly vigorous start to the new year. This is the number, isn't it? 38,915.87, the last trading day of 19. 1989 uh, and that all-time high. Do you think we're going to get there sooner, first half, or more of a second half story for you? Well, we're very bullish. Uh, Japan have been for some time. Uh, we tend to frame things in terms of topics targets rather than uh, Nikkei. And in terms of the topics, the target we have at the moment, the base case 2600, uh, we have made some very good progress towards that. But the bull case of 2800 is coming into frame, particularly as you were mentioning earlier that the yen is tracking somewhat weaker uh, than indeed we or the consensus was expecting at the start of this year. And uh, we're getting continued gains by Japanese corporates in terms of the global sectors in which they compete. One of the things that's so exciting about Japan is two-thirds of sectors in Japan are improving operating margins versus global peers right now. And that's not just a yen weakness story. It's the result of a productive capex cycle that's been going on for at least a decade now. A lot of this has been based on kind of the, 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 the big thematics that have been in place for Japan for some time now, right? And it feels like the argument is that this time it really is different. I do wonder, though, has it actually materialized? Because about 60% of prime listed companies, so I guess it's supposed to be the best in class for Japan, have failed to present plans to improve governance and share prices. We're also seeing kind of a, even just a failure to kind of present uh, what they intend to do. How much progress do you actually need to see to justify uh, the exuberance that we have when it comes to Japan equities right now? Well, there are a very large number of stocks uh, listed in Japan in, in the thousands. But actually, if you look at the large cap uh, names, uh, particularly uh, look at the performance in terms of corporate return on equity, uh, when I picked up coverage of Japan in uh, 2012, uh, MSCI Japan was uh, delivering about 4% ROE. That's closer to 10% now. Uh, and the market was trading uh, below book value. And now we're actually looking at the, the market probably trading up to around 1.8 times price 
price to book. So moving really into the sort of central zone of global equity markets, having been you know, somewhat in the wilderness for uh, the 20 years prior to 2012. So it's been a long journey and not every Japanese corporate has participated in it, but the, the large cap stocks have already been doing well for some considerable time. Jonathan, your other leader in the Asia story is India. Are the premium valuations at this point, given the exuberance that we've already seen in 2023, justified? Yeah, so that's uh, the second most expensive market in the world uh, after the US. Um, corporate ROE is around 16%, but you're paying almost four times price to book for that. So the issue here is how sustainable is that ROE in a nominal GDP growth environment that's probably at least 12%, and where the Indian currency is far more stable than it used to be in the past. One of the remarkable things about India is its transformation on the current account position and strong capital inflows from FDI and private equity. So the Indian rupee more or less sailed through 500 basis points of Fed rate hikes, um, hardly moving in real terms. So it is realistic to think of 12%, maybe even 15% compound nominal dollar EPS growth. Uh, but you certainly are paying up for that, and it's not as cheap a market as Japan is. Mm. Jonathan, how much is India, though, benefiting from the geopolitical flows that we're seeing away from China in this de-risking, decoupling move? Well, one of our big investment themes at Morgan Stanley is the multipolar world theme, which we've been writing about really since 2018. And as part of that, you're seeing a, a number of dimensions around uh, trade, as I just touched on, foreign direct investment, private equity, security spending. And broadly speaking, uh, India is advantaged in that world that we're now in, um, as indeed is, is Japan. Jonathan, I said de-risking and decoupling, but What's the risk of that orderly de-risking becomes decoupling and what would that mean for Chinese assets? Well, we frame it more in terms of what we call multipolar world, but yes, I understand the terms that you're referring to. I think in relation to China, what you're seeing is that Chinese exports in increasingly are successful in, in what might, one might term friendly geographies in uh, parts of the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, uh, Russia clearly. Um, and yet you've got challenges in relation to uh, Chinese exports in some of the uh, advanced economies, the allies of the United States and the US itself. Um, and particularly this sort of technological uh, transfer issue or let's say um, the sort of the restrictions that are put in place on Chinese acquisition of technology, they are leading to some degree of um, de-risking moving into even in some form of decoupling, yes. Jonathan, it's been a horrible couple of days for, uh, it's been a horrible, uh, more prolonged period of time for Chinese assets, but for uh, Hong Kong listed Chinese assets in particular. Do you see any prospect of an improvement? Because I feel like sort of the levels that you guys are looking at are perhaps even more bearish than a lot of the other investment strategists that we've spoken to. Do you think there is going to be the big bang stimulus that seems to be at this point the threshold for international investors to be compelled even by very cheap valuations. We think uh, stimulus is needed um, in relation to the consumer. Uh, and that the key to the situation in China right now is that the consumer and particularly consumer services spending uh, needs to come to the fore. Um, China is exhibiting signs of what we've called a, a 3D problem, a de demographic deflation problem. And consumers are starting to tighten their belts, uh, pay down mortgage debt for the first time ever. And when we actually look at the nominal GDP growth environment, it's completely different from what we're seeing in India and Japan. It's uh, well below 5%, not showing any signs of recovery. So for the first time in 30 years, Japanese nominal GDP growth last year exceeded that of China. And Indian nominal GDP growth is getting on for two and a half times that of China. So this is what we mean by a new era in Asia and EM equities. Um, China has really moved into a much slower growth path. And corporate earnings expectations are not up to speed with that. Um, we are continuing to see downward revisions to earnings estimates for China and Hong Kong, whereas we get continual upward earnings estimates for Japan and India. Can you talk about the need for more forceful 
counter-cyclical measures directed at the consumer and the household. Jonathan, what does that look like? Do you, are we talking about direct payments? Is that something that could potentially you know, lift the weight of what we are seeing as a deflationary cycle and a cycle of downward demand and confidence? Uh, yes, uh, I think things like consumer vouchers or other measures to support uh, the consumer and also private business investment, uh, which, is, which is weak, um, they are actually needed. And in terms of the quantum, I think that we are looking for uh, a needed stimulus of at least, say, 3% of GDP and maybe higher, bearing in mind how big the property sector was at the top in early 2021 and the significant uh, reduction in property sector activity and all the ancillary services that feed into the property sector that's now ongoing, plus the effect that's having on the consumer psyche. Again, this tendency of consumers now to be unwilling to take on new debt, even in a lower interest rate environment, is very familiar to people who looked at Japan uh, 30 years ago. <coughs> It's really great to have you back with us. Jonathan Garner, always good to see you. Chief Asian EM strategist at Morgan Stanley. It's been about 11 minutes since the start of trading in Japan. Let's turn to Bell for what's moving, Bell. Yeah, well, actually, it's been uh, a little bit interesting because we've actually seen the, the the Nikkei now turning positive. So we came online into the red, but there are some stocks or sectors that are helping it turn positive once again. And uh, one of those is actually what we're seeing in these tourism-related stocks because we got the tourism numbers out uh, yesterday afternoon and we're seeing a pretty steady recovery for, for the economy there or country because Japan overall, they welcomed 25 million tourists in 2023. So we're we're around 80% of the pre-COVID levels at this point in time, but that is the biggest number that we've seen since 2019. And into the end of last year, we actually started to surpass pre-pandemic levels as well for tourism. Uh, weak yen, that's part of the story there, but uh, certainly a lot of travellers uh, really looking to, to go to Japan as well. So that is supportive for some of these stocks. Let's also change on because there's another, another group of stocks we're watching this morning. The Cosby, uh, likewise, still uh, f fairly flat right now, but we do have some Samsung and Samsung suppliers that are posting some modest gains here. So we had Samsung unveiling the latest iteration of its Galaxy product family. This is the Galaxy S24. It's the, the most direct rival that it has to the iPhone. Lots of new different capabilities in the device. There's inbuilt uh, live voice and text translation of calls. It's got new search functionality that uses the AI capabilities not only of Samsung but also of Google. And some analysts like KB Security saying that this new smartphone could pose the biggest Galaxy sales in eight years. So uh, Samsung really looking to take a large share of the AI phone market in the next couple of years and it's the Galaxy S24 is seen as being pretty pivotal to that. So the stock is a little bit high today and also some of the companies that get a lot of their sales from Samsung as well, Heidi. Well, coming up next, we'll be hearing from Hong Kong's Finance Secretary Paul Chan and why he's upbeat on the city's property market in the long term. This is Bloomberg. Is, you know, maybe a lack of convictions in the markets at this point. We've saw, we've seen the 10-year that once again it's just like over 4%. So when you start combining higher interest rate, a lot of geopolitical flashpoints around the world. I mean, some co concerns that maybe the growth rate in China was slightly below what it, what is you know what people were expecting to be. All those things, I mean, get together and and and, and create an environment where investors are selling. HKX CEO Nicolas Agustin in Davos. Hong Kong's finance secretary, meanwhile, says he's upbeat on the city's property market in the long term. Paul Chan told us the interest rate environment should be more stable this year and is already seeing signs of capital inflows to the city. I think the market did have been affected by sentiment. Uh, but going forward this year, interest rate is going to be coming down and the mainland economy coming out from adjustment last year on a sustained and 
stable growth in the coming year. So I'm optimistic about 2024 and 2025. It is about confidence. It is about trust. How does it get fixed? Well, you know, there could be some misinformation. If I look at the total bank deposits uh, of the Hong Kong, Hong Kong banking system, at the end of December, it was about 5% higher than last year. So the figures indicate that indeed net capital flow is inflow instead of outflow. So I think it is important to communicate uh, with the investing public about the factual situation in Hong Kong. So what's your pitch here in Davos? Does the pitch involve at all the rapid recovery of China? Well, China is recovering. Uh, the economic growth is being stable. And at the working committee meeting last December, they stressed about stability. Stability about the property market, about the local government debts, about following expectation of China's economic growth. 2023, the economic growth was about 5.2%, exceeding the initial target of 5%. This year, 2024, the target is about 4.6%. So it is on the right track. As to Hong Kong, I think now could be good timing for people, for long-term investors, no matter it is our real estate market or the property market. You talk about stability in the property market. There isn't stability just yet, not in China, not in Hong Kong. When you take a look at property prices in Hong Kong in particular, they've been on the decline. How do you arrest the problem? Well, it is on the decline because interest rate was high. The geopolitical tension was challenging. Uh, people concerned about the economic recovery. But coming going into 2024, the interest rate environment got stabilized. Interest rate cut is coming. The economic situation, uh, particularly in China and developing Asia, are very positive. So I do think, say for example, for the property market, the pent up demand is there. When people are more clear about the interest rate environment, then I think, uh, they would be able to better assess when to uh, fulfill their demand. But, but are you considering other measures to bring back stability? Would you consider easing the cooling measures for the property sector? Uh, what are some of the things you're thinking about? Yeah, I'm afraid that I would not be able to comment on that. But let me assure you, the Hong Kong SAR government has been monitoring the situation very closely. Our policy objective is to uh, have a healthy property market. Which, which grows in line with our economic development. And when do you see that happening? Well, you know, short term, in terms of market, there is bound to be adjustment. But in the medium to long term, I'm positive. Hong Kong Finance Secretary Paul Chan is speaking with Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin in Davos. And you can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Bloomberg subscribers can go to Daybreak Go on your terminals. It's also available on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customize those settings so you just get the news on the industries and assets that you care about. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. CBS News says the U.S. has conducted a fourth round of strikes on Houthi targets in Yemen. That comes after a third commercial vessel this week was attacked by a drone launched from Houthi-controlled areas. U.S. Central Command says the ship was the U.S.-owned Genko Picardy. Earlier, Washington redesignated the Houthis as a terrorist group, partly unwinding an earlier move by the Biden administration as the U.S. sought to ease a humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Well, the European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde says a rate cut could come later this year. Speaking at Bloomberg House in Davos, Lagarde says more evidence, though, is needed before policymakers can be sure that inflation in the Eurozone is under control. I'm confident that short of another major shock, we have reached, reached a peak. Okay? 
Now, we have to stay restrictive for as long as necessary to make sure that we get to that state where we are all saying, OK, confident that it is at 2% medium term. I know some people argue that maybe we are overshooting, maybe we're taking risks. I think the risk would be worse if we went too fast and had to come back to more tightening, because we would have wasted all the efforts that everybody has put in the last 15 months. But, but this would be, again, economically, or also the, the trust in central banks? If you get this wrong, does it hurt the credibility? Credibility matters, let's face it. When we say we will get to 2% medium term, and this will happen in the medium term as we define it, uh, if people believe in that, and they should, because we will do it. Uh, it, it matters. It is a component in the in the, the, the sort of chemistry that determines inflation going forward. And again, so the time is quite fluid, but th there seems to be uh, a majority on the governing council that it expected probably by the summer, if not in the summer. You know, and you've talked to some of them. They have spoken recently, and each of them has their view, uh, which is which I respect completely. Yeah. We we generally coalesce uh, yeah. towards um, the decisions that we make on the basis of data. Yeah. Some of them have their local domestic data. Yeah. They have their respective inflation rates, which are different from one country to the other in the in the euro area. Where, if you look at Portugal, if you look at Germany, it's going to be different, obviously. Yeah. But it's, and it's their job to say, well, it's likely that. I would say it's likely too, but I have to be reserved because we are also saying that we are data dependent and that there is still a level of uncertainty and some indicators that are not anchored at the level where we would like to see them. The US election. Yeah, let me have some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> How worried are you about the US election? It's for the American people to decide what they want uh, with their politics, with their government, with their future. But obviously, we are all concerned about it because the United States is the largest economy, the largest uh, defense country in the world, and has been a, a, a beacon of democracy with all its upside and downside. But this is, this is what they should be considering, and of course, we cannot interfere with their choice. It's their choice, and that's the, the beauty of democracy. But we have to be extremely attentive and anticipate, just as we do with inflation. ECB President Christine Lagarde there speaking with Francine Lacqua at Bloomberg House in Davos. Take a look at how European futures in Europe are opening. It has really been a, a difficult environment uh, for risk trading at the moment. We're seeing Eurostox 50 futures largely unchanged at the moment. More or less the same when it comes to trading in German DAX futures. We did see European stocks dropping for a third day on these concerns over China's economic growth data. Disappointing investors, of course, continuing to be concerned about the path of central bank policy and when uh, these uh, potential moves towards easing could happen. HSBC also warring of an equity correction in Europe. This is Bloomberg. All right, it is a really a challenging session for markets at the moment as we have really myriad risks to be concerned about from China's economic slowdown, the worsening data points, as well as, uh, of course, the uncertain path to easing from major central banks. This is a picture as we get, of course, jobs data out of Australia released today. Uh, we have the employment change, seeing actually uh, a contraction of over 65,000 jobs from that uh, broader employment picture in Australia really giving back basically all and then some of the gains made in the previous month. Uh, December, the surveyed expectation was actually for a gain of 15,000, so quite a bit of uh, turbulence there. The unemployment rate staying on hold at 3.9%, so the same as the previous reading and in line with expectations. The participation rate falling a little bit to 66.8. That is a little bit softer than expectations as well. The full-time employment change for December, seeing a fall of 106 over 106,000 full-time jobs uh, being taken from the economy. That is uh, following a 57,000 gain in the previous reading. Part-time unemployment, though, seeing a gain of 41,000 for the Australian economy. So, of course, all of this really feeding into 
potentially what we see from the RBA, in particular in light of what we've seen as declining uh, consumer conf confidence going into the start of the year as well. Households, individuals remaining anxious about finances, clearly going into uh, what has been a series of rapid rate increases. We're seeing in that market reaction as well, both in the dollar uh, and in uh, Australian stocks, Bell, as we saw that pretty shock decline in employment in the December reading. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you can see here we've got ASX 200 shares under pressure again for a fifth straight session so far as we get online, about 90 minutes so far into trading. Uh, that is also being felt, these these concerns around the, the prospect for rate cuts, very much in what we're seeing in the bond space this morning because you're seeing yields moving higher at the front end of the curve. That's a two-year there. We can also show the three-year yield as well. It's just adding, uh, again, as investors think that the Fed really is going to be looking to deliver delay any sort of rate cuts and the RBA we know is red as well already likely to stay higher for longer. Uh, so there is that that reaction that we're getting to the strong US retail sales. There's also as well these concerns around the health of China's economy and that big sell off that came through in equities yesterday in Hong Kong also on the mainland. You can see here futures are just pointing to some very modest gains so it tells us that investors are still very nervous in this sort of market. Our currencies are looking a little bit mixed so far in the session but mostly we've been moving to the downside here with that dollar strength with that move as well in treasuries in terms of what's sort of standing out or has been standing out it's still Japanese equities modestly higher at this point in time but let's bring up a terminal chart and just look at how much investors are continuing to favor this market because we get the foreign flow for international buyers on a weekly basis and this chart here shows us that last week uh, foreigners or international investors were net buyers once again so foreign buying hitting a three-month high back to what we had seen at the end of last year in October uh, really choosing to prefer this market for a variety of reasons uh, geopolitical Cool. There's also dovish BOJ, that Japanese currency weakness playing into it, corporate governance reforms, uh, quite a long list, really. Uh, where else investors have been sort of choosing to pull their money from is Korea. If you take a look now at this terminal chart, it shows you uh, the, the daily stock market flows. Yesterday, a very bad session, about $800 million of shares being sold alone, uh, one of the worst starts that we've seen as well to Korean equities over the course of this year. Interesting as well to note that sort of correlation that we see between South Korea and Taiwan, Sherry, uh, given that these markets are both very reliant on the health of the tech sector and any sort of signals we see of a pickup in chip demand. Yeah, we'll get more indication from earnings results today. TSMC unveiling its fourth quarter results that will add details to top line sales figures that were in line with its performance a year earlier. There are already signs of a widely anticipated recovery in chip demand data from from the Semiconductor Industry Association, showing that November marked the first time in a year that global chip sales rose. Our next guest says TSMC is well positioned for AI chips. Marco Metzger, Executive VP and CEO of Nomonda, joins us from Taipei. Great to have you with us. So uh, give us a little bit of a preview of what we're expecting from TSMC and if that robust demand for those AI chips will actually be reflected in the results. Yeah, good morning, Sherry. Uh, yes, I think uh, for TSMC, um, this year has to get a much better year than uh, last year. The semiconductor industry was, was under a lot of challenges uh, last year. And especially if you look at TSMC on their six and seven nanometer process nodes, the utilization was probably only 50%. So it's expected this year that uh, this uh, utilization is coming up to 80%. And the uh, process nodes uh, beyond uh, that, like like uh, three nanometer, uh, four nanometer, five nanometers. This is where the high volume consumer electronics customers, for example, like Apple and even Intel are utilizing the manufacturing capabilities of TSMC to bring out the chips for the increasing demand, uh, for example, in the PC and notebook market, which is also supposed to be bouncing back this year. Yeah, I wanted to get to that because we have seen that softness not only in the PC market, but also in the smartphone space as well. When can we expect that rebound and how much would that benefit TSMC? 
Yeah, that's correct. I mean, the, the biggest hit is really last year was on the 6 and the 7 nanometer because there's a lot of the, the, the chips which are used, uh, application processors in the in the smartphones. Uh, and this dropped significantly, right? Uh, everybody uh, was hoping, you know, it continues to go up. But you have to understand, uh, we have today more mobile phone contracts than basically people living on Earth. So we have a certain level of saturation on that market. So what it could benefit is that you see a shift globally on more higher end smartphones which use more content uh, more memories more chips inside more advanced products and this can drive even with the stagnation of the volumes which is shipped uh, tsmc output because more of the high quality parts are going into these smartphones we have seen when it comes to really advanced AI high bandwidth memory, um, that race being really dominated by SK Hynix and other names out there as well. How does CSMC compete in this space and can we expect this to become uh, challenging in the years to come given as well that governments around the world are investing so much in this sector? Right. I think for, for memories, TSMC is not playing directly in the HBM or in the memory field, but of course, they are building the core processors for NVIDIA, for AMD, uh, which using the HBM, right? So for the uh, for the chips itself, uh, the market leader like, like NVIDIA is producing at TSMC and it's also the packaging. So it's not just on the wafer level, they also make uh, the advanced packaging. And this was a challenge for TSMC, especially last year ramping up. We have seen the numbers, I mean, amazing numbers from NVIDIA. I think it was in Q3 when, when also the investors saw how much revenue they were able uh, to capture for this uh, AI. And it continues to drive um, them up, but there was a bottleneck and this was the advanced packaging, like the co was from TSMC see and this also will be uh, will be solved this year that the capacity uh, can meet also the demand for this so I expect there will be also more shipments than possible for um, uh, companies around the world to be able to get their hands on uh, the AI chips and speaking of the memory the HBM you mentioned SK Hynix is very well positioned they have been like very early in this space and they benefited from this but don't get this wrong because Micron Technology and also Samsung, they are working hard on the catch up. And so there will be definitely also some more competition than we have seen this year on the HBM market for these memory players. Marco, what are some of the key points that you're watching in this de-risking, decoupling of supply chains being played out in the semiconductor space in 2024 and beyond? Yeah, I think many countries have uh, special programs, subsidy programs in order to be able uh, to attract semiconductor companies to go into their region. And again, if you're looking at TSMC, they have made the move to go in three major re regions to their customers. So we have USA expansion, uh, we have Japan expansion. And we have a Europe expansion. Europe is a little bit special because there, I think it's called ESMC, the European Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, where you have like 30% of the uh, of the company owned by European companies, um, where they are able then basically to secure supply, especially in Europe, you know, there's a strong automotive industry and they have been hit very, very hard during the COVID time and the supply chain challenges. So there's a way that Europe tries to mitigate or to balance uh, this out in order to build up also like a, a smaller version of a semiconductor ecosystem. Because I think still worldwide, the most complete semiconductor system is in Taiwan. Um, but even there, you know, they need chemicals from Japan in order to manage this, or they need ASML equipment from Europe. So semiconductor industry is a highly, highly connected uh, uh, industry globally. So um, decoupling, I would say, is almost impossible. The risking to a certain extent is possible and also necessary, not only because of political reasons. I think it's also because if you think about Japan, Taiwan, it's like we are living in an earthquake region, right? So and we have seen this before. This can also happen. So I think people, companies and, and, and um the activities, they are more concerned to have more regional hubs in order to build up a more resilience against the semiconductor supply chain disruptions.
Interesting. Marco Mescor, good to have you with us. Executive VP and CEO of Nomonda joining us from Taipei. We have more to come. This is Bloomberg. Time to look ahead to the market opens in Hong Kong and mainland China as mixed economic data reinforced bearish sentiment. The northbound stock connect saw big outflows on Wednesday. Our Asia equities reporter Charlotte Yang joins us now from Hong Kong. What can we expect today? Yeah, it was such a painful and ugly soft yesterday, and it's actually, you know, some even some of the long-term China bullish investors have been started, you know, asking what are they waiting for, um, you know, in this waiting game because as China is such a waiting game, and 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 where's you know Chinese Premier uh, Li Chang's remarks at Davos? I think a lot of investors are now uh, lowering the expectations that there will be any um, big massive stimulus. Um, so the, the the market currently is a situation where there is no conviction and lacks any clear catalyst. But uh, with that said, um, I think there could be some of the really brave and courageous um, investor that's willing to bottom fish at this level um, because after the recent sell of the valuations is at an even on cheaper levels. And for specific stocks such as May 20, the stock has actually filled below its initial IPO price in 2018. Um, so we're definitely uh, worth watching how today re uh, opens. You have to be so selective when it comes to opportunities, right? Are we seeing sort of some of the domestic travel uh, related stocks potentially presenting some good value? Yeah, so for the onshore um, stock market, uh, you know, recently a really hot stock is uh, the, the travel, domestic travel stock. So there's a city uh, called uh, in the northern part of China that has been attracting a lot of uh, a lot of attention from tourists called Hot being it's icy and photogenic, and that has you know helped bring some sentiment in the uh, domestic market for the travel companies that are particularly domestically travel focused, um, as consumers seems to still be uh, very much high on you know traveling within China. China. And you know, as onshore market in, uh, traders are often outlook uh, seeking out you know somatic trade ideas. But at the moment, you know, broader market lacks such good ideas. So we're having seen a uh, particular interest in uh, the domestic focused small cap travel firms. Our Asia Equities reporter Charlotte Yang there with us. Well, China's population declined at a faster pace in 2023 as births fell to a record low. It's a demographic shift that poses long-term challenges to a government already contending with deflationary pressures and a structural property crisis. Joining us now is Bloomberg's chief Asia economist, Chang Shu. So the demographics are not stacking up in Beijing's favor, right? They, they, they told people to go and have more kids, right? They've tried to dismantle the one child policy, but it's proving to be not that much of an incentive. Yes, indeed, at this point, the demographic trend is is very challenging. Um, it will have a very important, significant uh, long-term uh, growth impact. Uh, we know the uh, population started to decline in 2022. Um, the, um, in 2023, the trend accelerated. And, and, and that's because a lot of young people are are very concerned and um, because of uh, increases in increasing in job and income uh, uh, insecurity. So, so um, we uh, in Bloomberg Economics we've done long-term projection, factoring in the acceleration in population decline and uh, and uh, the property slump. Now we see uh, growth could uh, decelerate to 3.5%. Uh, by 2023, and that's quite a significant downward revision of long-term growth. Previously, we were looking at growth above 4% um, before 2020, um, before 2030. So it's um, it's it, it's quite a, um, a, a, a worrying trend. And it really doesn't help that we continue to see Chinese people hoarding cash because you're not seeing that strong safety net 
in society, right? You have to save money in order to, you know, carry out elderly care, but also for your own retirement. How does this compare to what happened to Japan in the 1990s, where we also had a declining population, shrinking population, combine that with people really scared to spend? How detrimental is this for the Chinese economy? Yeah, I, I think that does bring um, back the e experience uh, with Japan. The, there are some uh, similarities there, certainly China, um, because of the declining uh, population and then uh, the uncertainties people are facing, people are, are increasing their precautionary spending. That's one, one issue. And there's also lack of... Of um, of alternative investments, so so they are just holding cash. Yeah, uh, I guess one potential um, difference uh, we we are not quite seeing yet. Yet, but one potential difference could be the government has learned the lesson. Chinese government uh, uh, learns the lesson from Japan's experience. And therefore, um, uh, it would I I increase spending at a time during. Japan Japan's experience, people, um, you know, the private sector people, um, households and, and companies uh, try to reduce spending whilst the government try to reduce spending at the same time. But um, I guess one lesson from Japan of that period is the government might do a bit more to boost the overall uh, demand of the economy. Such a tricky demographic situation to be in and to try and reverse that too. Changshu, Bloomberg's chief Asia economist there with us on uh, Beijing's demographic woes on top of everything else. Uh, this is the picture as we take a look at trading in Australia. Uh, it is a down uh, picture really across asset classes, right? We're seeing weakness of about half a percent, pairing some of the steeper parts of those losses uh, in that reaction to the surprising tumble that we saw in Australian unemployment numbers in December. Four straight months of gains has been snapped. Unemployment, though, staying pretty much steady as fewer people were seeking work but that shedding of over 65,000 roles versus a forecast of a 15,000 increase the participation rate also sliding all of this meaning that we are seeing that kind of repositioning in swaps traders boosting their bets on the RBA cutting uh, by about a 55 percent chance of that that they'll lower borrowing costs in the August decision the Aussie dollar also seeing a bit of weakness there as well more to come this is Bloomberg Welcome back. HCL Tech Chair Roshni Nadar Mahotra says it's a great time for businesses to be in India. Speaking to Bloomberg in Davos, she explained the twofold strategic benefit for investors. I think it's a great time to be in India. And uh, the opportunities that we're seeing for HCL, I would say, are twofold. I think uh, in terms of uh, a lot more of our clients and customers from all over the world, willing to be delivered out of India, much more uh, validation of the talent that we have and how we can upskill that talent. And uh, so they are much more willing not just to go to the main cities, which are your Bangalores and your Chennai's, but even looking at tier two and tier three cities. So I think we're seeing a lot of that. Um, and of course, what's buoying India's growth is also this extremely young, demographic, which is um, digital natives. So I think uh, for HCL, it's a great opportunity even domestically when we think of, uh, you know, HCL software and uh, a large buyer's ecosystem, which is actually within the com country. So I think uh, India is uh, going to be a good uh, strategic market for us, which hasn't been actually historically. So what kind of investments are you looking at? So, um, I mean, because we're an Indian-based organization, we have our largest investments is uh, of the 250,000 people that we um, have, um, a majority of them are from India. We continue to open new um, IT delivery centers in tier two, tier three cities, um, just looking at that. Um, network of where talent is, um, then within the group we have um, 
and a tech company. And it's it, and it, we've had phenomenal growth over the last year. We've got 2.6 million learners, out of which 50% are women working and training and skilling in data science and full stack development. Um, we've got a healthcare business which is growing and. Uh, um, because we have so many global customers as well as global companies coming and setting up strategic uh, excellence centers within the country, there is a big opportunity um, to work with them on um, the healthcare needs for their employee base and setting up healthcare services for each one of them. Um, we're in the moment, in the process of um, exploring opportunities in the semiconductor space as well within the country. Um, so I think there's a lot in the works and it's a good time to be in India and be Indian. HCL Tech Chair Roshni Nader Mahotra there speaking to us in Davos. Take a look at some of the stocks that we're watching as markets open in Hong Kong and mainland China are bracing for that open really uh, as we get there keeping an eye on Samsung suppliers the smartphone maker unveiling their Galaxy S24 product line this is the latest version of its most direct iPhone rival and of course big focus on uh, the AI elements in this range some of the stocks on our radar are Lens Technology, uh, GoTech, Sunny Optical and AI. AC tech. So some of those usual suspects when it comes to handset providers. And this is a picture across the future space as we continue to watch the offshore yuan at that 721 level against the U.S. dollar as we continue to see dollar strength as Treasury yields and global bond yields continue to rise. Bloomberg Markets China Open is next. This is Bloomberg.